Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all having an amazing day. I hope you're having an amazing holiday period. In today's video, we're going to be covering another Mystery Monday case and it's going to be my last for the year. I'll have one more in January and then it's going to be back to regular scheduling in February because I'm actually moving across the world in January or early February. I'm going to be moving to London, which is so exciting. We're going to be so much closer to everything. It's like an hour flight to Italy. It's going to be amazing. Whereas here it's like a 24 hour flight to anywhere in Europe and it's like two and a half thousand dollars. So it's going to be a really nice experience to just live there for two years is what our visa is for. So it's going to be so amazing. We're super, super excited, but it means I've only got one video in January because moving overseas to literally the other side of the world is, it's a big task. <laughs> It's a little stressful, so I promise February will get settled and everything will go back to normal with my videos. But that is why my videos have kind of been like two weeks between videos and stuff because there's been a lot going on. Another very exciting thing with all that's been going on is I actually got engaged. <laughs> Carrie and I got engaged about a month ago, which I still am in shock. I stare at my hand like every five seconds of every single day. So yeah, it's been a very big, exciting time. A lot's happening. So that's kind of why my videos are a little bit sporadic, but it will get better soon once we're all settled in London. So today, like I said, we're going to be doing a Mystery Monday case and we're going to be talking about the suitcase murder, which has been so requested on my channel. And I can see why, because this case is insane. If you guys do have any case requests, please leave them in the comments down below because I definitely read all of them and you guys send in some really interesting requests. And if you do want me to do like a form or something, please just let me know because I can always like make one up and put it in the description in future videos. Before we do get into it, I just quickly want to thank today's sponsor a case to five for making this video possible they are my go-to tech accessory brand and i have been using their cases religiously for years now i don't use anything else on my phone i absolutely swear by them i'm currently using one of their clear cases at the moment because i mean a clear case is a classic and case to five's clear cases actually have uv defender technology which prevents yellowing which is so perfect because i swear with other brands when i used to use other brands years ago i went through clear cases like there is no tomorrow because they go yellow so quickly but the case to five ones are so durable they last for so long they're really slim while still being super durable they're approved for drops of up to 6.6 .6 feet and they also have 360 protection but if you need something even sturdier than that they have bounce cases which have eco shock impact absorption tech and they are approved for drops of up to 21 feet there's over 2,000 designs curated by their global network of artists through their artist program and they also have have different customization options so there really is something for everybody and if you guys are interested in checking them out you can go to casetified.com slash bella for 15% off your order so make sure you guys check that out and I will leave all of the information in the description down below and let's go ahead and get into today's mystery monday case so Melanie Slate was born on the 8th of October in 1972 in Ridgewood, which is in New Jersey. And she grew up both there in Ridgewood and also in the Middleton Township in New Jersey. She went on to pursue a double major in math and psychology at Rutgers University. And she graduated from there in 1994. And then after that, she went on to complete a nursing diploma at the Charles E. Gregory School of Nursing in 1997. And then in 1999, she started work as a nurse in the Reproductive Medicine Associate, which is one of the country's largest fertility clinics. She was a great nurse. She was loved by her patients and was very skilled at her job. And that same year in 1999, she also married a man named Bill McGuire. They had met a couple of years earlier when they were working as waiters at the same restaurant and they were immediately smitten with each other. Bill was a US Navy veteran and he was born on the 21st of September in 1964. And he was a really intelligent guy. He later went on to work as a computer program grammar at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. A year after they got married in the year 2000, they brought their first child, a son, into the world. And then two years later in 2002, they had a second son and they decided to raise them in the Woodbridge Township, which is a pretty small community with a population of about 100,000 people. And it was about half an hour away from Melody's work at the fertility clinic, which was located in Morristown, which was a much smaller town. By all accounts, the Maguire 
guys were a really happy family, they were a happy couple, and from the outside it looked like they had the perfect marriage. Friends have said Bill was a charismatic guy with a great sense of humour, and Melanie was incredibly smart and witty, so they were a great match and really kept each other on their toes. So let me take you forward to 2004. Melanie and Bill have been married for five years at this point, and they were looking to move out of Woodbridge and kind of upgrade to a bigger place in Warren County because, you know, they were raising their two sons in an apartment, so they were ready to expand as their family grew. And they had found this great house with a big yard, which they put an offer on. They closed on the sale of the house on the 28th of April in 2004, which was huge. I mean, it's so exciting to not only have have the ability to purchase a house, but to purchase this house that has a big yard and a lot of room for growth, it's just such an achievement, such an exciting thing for the whole family. And at this point, Melanie was 31 and Bill was 39 and their two sons were three and five, but unfortunately they would never move into this home. On the 5th of May, just a week after the Maguires closed on their dream home, a suitcase was pulled out of Chesapeake Bay by a group who was out there fishing together. So two dads had let their two sons have the day off school so that they could all go fishing together. And while they were out there, they saw this suitcase, which, you know, they were really excited to pull up because they thought there might be something valuable in it. And one of the men on the trip, Chris Henkel, said that when they pulled the suitcase onto the boat, they immediately noticed how heavy it was. And when they opened the suitcase and unzipped it, they realized it was full of just this big black trash bag, which was kind of covering what was inside the suitcase. And while one of the young boys was really excited to see what was inside, so he just goes in and he rips this trash bag open, which reveals human legs, which just imagine, you know, you're so excited, you've gotten the day off school to go fishing with your buddy and your dad and your friend's dad, and you see the suitcase, you think there's something exciting in it, and then you see human legs. Like, it must have just been so shocking. So they quickly call the police, the police come out and collect the remains, and they reported that the remains were still quite fresh, so they wouldn't have had that, like, decomposing smell. The men really wouldn't have known what to expect until they unzipped it and saw those legs in there. They wouldn't have smelt anything to know that anything was off. And obviously by this point, police were expecting that the other remains would show up because it wasn't, it was just the legs in this suitcase. Like it wasn't the rest of the remains. So they were expecting that they would show up, but they had no leads on who these remains belonged to at this point. And this case immediately garnered a lot of media attention because, you know, it's really not every day that you're finding human legs in a suitcase. And just for some context, Chesapeake Bay is about a five hour drive away from the Maguire's old apartment in Woodridge. So this wasn't even the same state. The remains were found in Virginia and the Maguires at this point were still living in their old apartment in Woodridge because like I said, they had only closed on the new house just a week earlier. So they hadn't even moved in there yet. They were still in the apartment waiting to move into the dream home, which as I mentioned, they would never have the chance to do. Now, if you think that this case wasn't gonna get any worse, then you must be new here because on the 11th of May, so six days after the first suitcase was found, another suitcase was found by a student student who was out bird watching on a little island off the eastern coast of Virginia known as Fisherman's Island. And this one, you know, had been a little bit longer. So this suitcase actually smelled really bad. It had a putrid smell. And that smell was enough for this student to be like, something's not right about this. I'm going to call the police. The police came, they collected it, and they sent it off for forensic examination. When they opened the black trash bag, they found a man's head and torso, which was wrapped in a hospital blanket. And this man's face, was still in a somewhat identifiable state, despite the fact that it was very bloated from being in the water. The medical examiner was also able to determine that the man was shot once in the head and twice in the torso, but they still weren't able to identify him at this point. But they were, you know, one step closer because now their arms were actually in this suitcase. So now they had the head, the arms, the torso, and the bottom part of the legs. The only thing that they didn't have was the pelvis and the upper legs, so the thigh area. And by this point, the case was huge. After they found this head, it just really blew up in the media, not just in Virginia either. This case was making national headlines, and I think everyone out on the water was probably keeping an eye out for another suitcase, even if they weren't doing it intentionally. I think in the back of their minds, they were probably looking out for 
for this final suitcase with the final part of the remains in them. And then finally, on the 16th of May, a boater found that third suitcase in around the same location as the first suitcase was located, so in Chesapeake Bay. And this suitcase contained the remainder of the remains. And so police were combing through missing persons databases, but they still weren't able to identify who the remains belonged to. Five days later, on the 21st of May, police released a composite sketch of what they believed the victim looked like. And it must have been a pretty accurate sketch because very shortly after someone actually identified the body, a woman named Susan Rice said that she believed the body belonged to Bill McGuire. Susan's husband, John, was actually really good friends with Bill. And originally when John saw this composite sketch that police released, he was like, nah, that's not Bill. But Susan was insistent. She was like, no, you know, you really should call the police. And so John called Crime Stoppers and reported that he believed that the victim was Bill McGuire and police used Bill's fingerprints to positively identify the victim as Bill McGuire. And then almost a month after Bill went missing, Melanie got the call from police informing her of her husband's death. And my first thought immediately was just those children, their two sons are just three and five years old and now they've been left without their dad. And it's just such a heartbreaking situation for everybody involved, for his friends, his family, everybody who knew him. And at this point, it's been about a month since the Maguires closed on their dream home. So how did they go from this perfect family ready to move into their new dream home that they've just purchased to finding themselves in the middle of this horrific situation? And why was Bill found so far away from where he lived? I'm honestly surprised that more people hadn't been asking where Bill was in the month leading up to the discovery of his remains. It seemed like nobody really was concerned until his body was found. Nobody had even reported him missing. Bill's sister, Cindy Lagosh, had actually called John just a couple of days before Bill's body was found because she hadn't heard from Bill. John and Bill was good friends, so she thought maybe John would know where he was and John knew nothing. And that's really the only time anybody asked about Bill. Cindy also said on this call to John that she had spoken to Melanie and Melanie had told her that she and Bill had gotten into this massive fight on the 29th of May, so the day after they closed on their house, and allegedly Bill became physically abusive and then stormed out of the house and he didn't come back. And Melanie had been very upfront about the events that took place on the day that obviously he disappeared or stormed out. She claims that the arguments stem from the fact that Bill really wanted to move to Virginia. That's where, you know, his close friend John and his wife Susan lived. And he just always really wanted to live there. Whereas Melanie wanted to stay in New Jersey. They just closed on this house in New Jersey. And so there was just a lot of built up resentment there. According to Melanie, Bill stuffed a dry sheet in her mouth, pinned her up against a wall, and then slapped her in the face, at which point she went and grabbed her youngest son and ran into the bathroom with him and locked the door. I'm not sure where their older son was in all of this, but either way, Bill was furious and he was yelling through the bathroom door saying, I'm gonna leave, I'm never gonna come back and it's gonna be your fault that your son and our children are gonna grow up without a father. And then he left and that was that. And Melanie just assumed that he had gone to Atlantic City because he often went there to gamble and that he would eventually come back and so she never deemed it necessary to report him missing even when he hadn't come back for nearly a month. It also came to light that Bill and Melanie had a pretty tumultuous relationship. According to one of Melanie's relatives, Bill had like a double-sided personality so he could be really sweet and loving and caring but then he could also be really manipulative and bitter. Bill also allegedly had a gambling problem and he would like I mentioned head out of town to go play at this casino in Atlantic City and I don't think he was like super rich or anything but one account I read online stated that he invited a bunch of friends out to the casino with him one night and he was just flashing $10,000 around that he obviously intended to gamble with so I think that he was like gambling above his means which 
would have been really frustrating for Melanie, but it's also hard to know because we really don't know a lot about their financial situation. Like I mentioned, at no point did Melanie file a missing persons report in the entire month that he was missing. She didn't file a report, nor did anyone. Nobody reported Bill missing in that whole month he was gone. But Melanie later said that she just thought he was being dramatic. He would always say things in arguments, apparently like I'm never coming back and stuff like that. And then shortly after he went missing, Melanie actually went and saw a divorce attorney who advised her not to file a missing persons report. Melanie also said that the day after Bill went missing was kind of just like any regular day for her. She took the kids to daycare and then she went about figuring out how to move on with her life. She also filed a restraining order against Bill because, you know, this guy had physically abused her. He had slapped her in the face, pinned her up against a wall. He stormed out and said that he was never coming back, which he allegedly did often, like leaving, saying, I'm not coming back. The kids are going to be left without a father. He was gambling their money away. They obviously had a lot of problems and she was just fed up. She was ready to draw a line in the sand and move on with her life and she made no attempts to contact Bill. I believe some of Bill's family members at some point realized that he was missing but no one like I said made any attempts to contact the police, report him missing. The police hadn't even heard Bill McGuire's name until his remains were identified and then even when his remains were identified and they contacted Melanie she didn't ask any questions she didn't even ask how he died which no matter the state of your marriage you think you'd at least be shocked enough to be like oh my god like what happened but she didn't she didn't ask anything and then on the 25th of May so four days after Bill's remains were identified she actually filed for divorce which is so quick like the dust hasn't even settled yet so I think they found that a little bit suspicious as well like they just figured she'd ask some questions at least for the children or something but they were willing to hear her out because if what she's saying is true and Bill abused her he slapped her in the face left said I'm never coming back and then went to Atlantic City to go and gamble then far out like you know she might be relieved that this guy who's abusing her is dead she might have been relieved that he went missing and never came back and she never heard from him again so anyway they bring her in for questioning and one of the detectives on the case a guy named Ray Pickell actually said she looked very like visibly nervous and she was shaking and everything. And she also brought two attorneys with her, which again, they found really weird because this wasn't like an interrogation or anything at this point. They were just questioning her. Obviously she is the victim's wife and the first person you have to look into and the first person you have to question is always the spouse or the significant other. So it was just very like full guns blazing for her to bring two attorneys with her for this interview. So while they're questioning her, they show her some photos of the suitcases that Bill's remains were found in and she confirms that those suitcases actually did belong to them. And then she also asks the detective, she's like, where did you find his car? And they tell her, we haven't found his car yet. And she's like, you guys should go and look in Atlantic City because I'm pretty sure that's where he went when he stormed out. So you might find his car there. Which, you know, again, could be considered a little bit suspicious that she's like, you know, go and look for his car. Like, I think I know where his car is. But at the same time, it could just be her being like wanting to know for sure that that's where he went when he stormed out and left. Now, on the same day that this interview took place, police also went to have a look through the Maguire's old apartment to look for any clues, but they came up empty handed because the place had been totally cleared out. But they did find out that Melanie had actually like sold or gotten rid of some of Bill's stuff. And she had done so by like her friend said, oh, my friend might want some of this stuff. So she gave it to her friend's friend and they tracked this guy down and found that Melanie gave all of Bill's stuff to this guy in black trash bags, just like the one that Bill's remains had been found in. And look, it is circumstantial evidence at best, but it's definitely looking very suspicious for Melanie. At this point, police also take Melanie's advice and they go to Atlantic City to look for Bill's car and they uncover that it was actually found at the Flamingo Hotel hotel in Atlantic City, but it had been towed on the 8th of May. It hadn't been searched because at this point it's just like kind of an abandoned car. Like there's no crime or anything related to it that would make them want to search it. So now that his remains have shown up, the forensic examiner was called in to look through his car for any evidence. So on the 15th of September, the Virginian police closed their case and they handed it over to the New Jersey police because they concluded that the murder took place in New Jersey and they didn't have any physical evidence to support this, but I guess the circumstantial evidence is what led them to believe it happened in New Jersey. 
and the circumstantial evidence was also enough for them to actually secure a warrant to secretly record Melanie's phone calls. And so it was around this time that it came out that Melanie was actually having an affair with a co-worker named Brad Miller. And he was a doctor at the fertility clinic that Melanie worked at, started off with, you know, just flirting. And then after Melanie came back from maternity leave after having her second child, that's when her and Dr. Miller started having like a full blown affair. Bill and Melanie were still living in their old apartment in Woodbridge and they were obviously having some marital problems. So it just begs the question, like why did she lead Bill on through all of this? Going as far as to purchase a new house with them so they could grow their family. And all the while she's going behind his back and having this full on affair with Dr. Miller. And he was not happy about all of this either. Like even the day that, or the afternoon that Bill and Melanie closed on their house, Dr. Miller was messaging Melanie being like, leave him, like don't go through with this, leave him and be with me. So at this point, like Melanie definitely has a major motive to have murdered her husband, Bill. And she's pretty much the only suspect. Like there's no evidence in this case, right? There's no like physical evidence at this point, but all of the circumstantial evidence is pointing to her. It's not pointing to anybody else. She's the only real suspect police have. And now Brad is also implicated too through his affair with Melanie that he was having at the time that Bill was murdered. So police continue their investigation and one of the avenues they looked into was they were looking for people close to Bill that might have owned a gun because obviously it was determined that he was shot once in the head and twice in the torso. So they were looking for somebody close to him that may have had a gun who may have had some sort of motive to kill him. After looking through all of the records in New Jersey, they didn't find anything of note. And so they decided to look into the neighboring state of Pennsylvania. And that is when they found a major piece of circumstantial evidence. Now, Pennsylvania at the time had more relaxed gun laws than New Jersey. I'm no gun expert. I'm not from the US, so I don't know a lot about it, but I believe they had like reduced wait times in Pennsylvania at the time, at least. And in some circumstances, you could actually get a gun the same day there like the same day that you applied for it. And as it turns out, Melanie actually traveled to Pennsylvania to purchase a gun two days before Bill went missing or, you know, two days before she claims Bill stormed out. So it's looking very suspicious. I mean, not only the fact that she purchased a gun two days before he went missing, but just also the fact that she traveled to another state to purchase this gun. Like, what was the rush? I can't think of another reason she would want to go to another state to purchase a gun unless she was in some sort of rush to have this gun. Her excuse for this was that she was actually purchasing it for Bill because Bill wasn't able to purchase a gun because he had like a felony conviction for driving or something. And so she claims that she was going to buy it for him, but why would she need to go to Pennsylvania to buy this gun for him? Why couldn't she do it in New Jersey? And also I just think the timing is too convenient. Two days before he you know, disappeared or stormed out. So if Melanie wasn't like already the number one suspect, she definitely was now. And like I mentioned, they'd been secretly recording her phone calls. They had recorded 500 phone calls over a 40 day period, which originally I was like, that is a suspiciously large amount of phone calls to make, but I calculated it and it's only 12 and a half phone calls a day. So it's really not that dramatic, but I will play you a few excerpts of these phone calls because there's definitely something fishy going on. This one's a phone call that was recorded between Melanie and her stepfather, a guy named Michael Caparero. Hey, how you doing? I spoke to, uh, uh, what's his name, about shipping. And Alex. Ship, uh, I didn't want to say name. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yep. Personally, I feel like her and her family knew in some way that their phones were being recorded because it's like they're trying to throw investigators off. It almost seems like they're speaking in code sometimes. And I can't see another reason like why they would speak like that. I can't imagine anyone just speaks like that normally. I mean, maybe they're just like making light of a tragedy, but it just seems very suspicious. Melanie always uses this phrase being cut off at the knees, which just kind of seems like she's referring to the way that Bill died because obviously that first suitcase that was found was his legs that had been cut off at the knees. At least meet with a lawyer ahead of time who might cut it off at the knees. Doesn't that look suspicious? It, it doesn't matter what it looks like. 
I mean, there's no real way to know if she's doing this on purpose, but it almost seems like she's either making light of it, she thinks it's funny that she had cut him off at the knees, or she's just trying to mess with investigators. Now, I'm not entirely sure of the intricacies between Melanie and Dr. Miller's relationship, but I can only assume that it became more than just an affair after Bill's murder, because a majority of the tapped phone calls were between her and Dr. Miller. Obviously, he was a suspect at this time because he had motive too. You know, this guy's been murdered, he's having an affair with the wife, and now they're like being together, calling each other all of the time after the murder, but he has always denied any involvement in the murder. At around this time, another man was actually introduced in this whole picture, and it was a guy named Jim Finn, and he was an old friend of Melanie's. They had met during nursing school, and he always had, you know, this big crush on Melanie, and Melanie knew that. She knew that he had a crush. She knew that she could always call him when she needed something, and that's why when she needed advice on how to buy a gun, she contacted Jim. Apparently, he was, like, really knowledgeable about guns, but the place my head goes to is why would she need to contact somebody else? about this gun like if she's buying it for bill why wouldn't she ask bill unless she was trying to hide this gun purchase from bill instead of actually purchasing it for him like she claimed so the police take jim in for questioning and they get his permission to record his phone calls with melanie and after doing that they realized pretty quickly that he wasn't actually involved in the murder and he was cleared so at this point all the police have are two pieces of circumstantial evidence the fact that melanie didn't report her husband missing and then also the fact that she she purchased a gun two days before he went missing. Another lead that they chased was the tip off that Melanie had told them that Bill's car might be in Atlantic City. And from her toll records, they were actually able to determine that she herself had made a few trips to Atlantic City. So Melanie claims that she went out there because she was angry, she was sick of his antics, and she thought, you know what, I'll just go and find him. And it's kind of crazy as well because Atlantic City's so big, it's kind of like searching for a needle in a haystack, but she found his car I mean maybe she just knew the spots that he always goes to and she looked there she found his car and then she moved his car to the Flamingo Hotel where it was later found she claims that she did this to like mess with him she just wanted it to be really inconvenient for him to find his car and she was kind of talking like this is something that's happened before like they've done to each other before but it's just weird because it's very contradictory to her previous statements where she said I filed a restraining order literally the day after he he left, like I wanted nothing to do with him, I didn't contact him, I was done with him, but oh actually I, I went out there because I was angry and I moved his car. Melanie even admitted herself that it sounds suspicious, but what investigators minds immediately went to was she's got to have an accomplice. Obviously at this point, investigators believe that she's murdered her husband, Bill, and then she drove Bill's car up to Atlantic City to kind of make it look like he stormed off and went there and that's where he got murdered or something bad happened to him, right? But both her car and Bill's car have now been placed in Atlantic City. So unless she called a taxi all the way to Atlantic City, then someone had to have driven either her or Bill's car up to Atlantic City. She couldn't have driven both cars there. So they pull up the CCTV for the car park of the Flamingo Hotel, but unfortunately, as these things always go, the CCTV footage is too blurry to make out anything. They can see the car arriving there, but they can't see the driver or make out really anything of value. Now through these toll records, they were able to identify another trip that Melanie had taken to Delaware. And this was five days after Bill went missing. And what's suspicious about this trip to Delaware Delaware was that in order to get to Virginia Beach, the typical route you would take is through Delaware. And if you followed the route all the way down, you would find yourself at the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, the same place where the first suitcase containing Bill's remains were found on the next day, the 5th of May the day after she went to Delaware. I don't think they could actually like pin her as being in Virginia Beach because the toll records didn't show that. Maybe there just wasn't a toll that she took to get to Virginia Beach. But this trip is not actually the most suspicious thing that she did, believe it or not. So she claims that she drove out there in the early hours of the morning because she wanted to go furniture shopping. And if she drove out there, 
she wouldn't have to pay a sales tax. I swear she just comes up with the weirdest excuses. It's like it's a tactic or something to just come up with the most bizarre excuses to throw investigators off. You know, maybe if it's so bizarre, it has to be true. How could she be making something this weird up? Like I've gone to Delaware in the early hours of the morning so I don't have to pay sales tax on my furniture. So at this point, there is all of this circumstantial evidence pointing to Melanie. She's the only suspect, but there is zero physical evidence in this case. No physical evidence at all to link Melanie or anyone else to this crime. Investigators are of the mindset that Melanie must have murdered Bill at their Woodbridge apartment. And so at this point, they really started to scour that apartment for any forensic evidence. They used luminol, they pulled walls apart, like they really thoroughly, thoroughly searched this apartment and still came up completely empty handed, which Melanie's thinking, you know, great, they've got no evidence and without any physical evidence, there's no crime, right? Well, not exactly, because the investigators believe that they had enough circumstantial evidence to convict Melanie of the murder. So on the 2nd of June, 2005, Melanie McGuire was arrested and charged with the first degree murder of her husband, Bill McGuire. She managed to post her $750,000 bail and she pled not guilty to the charge and then in October of that same year so 2005 she was hit with more charges which again she managed to post bail for and then again the next year October of 2006 they charged her with two more counts of hindering apprehension. And this was allegedly because she wrote letters to the police basically trying to tell them that she was innocent. She pled not guilty to this as well and then posted a $10,000 bail. Nearly three years after that first suitcase was found in Chesapeake Bay, on the 5th of March in 2007, Melanie McGuire's trial began for the first degree murder of her husband, Bill. And Melanie's team, her defense team, really had their work cut out for them in this one. They were basically trying to say that Bill was actually killed as a result of his gambling problem rather than having been killed by Melanie. Now the prosecution had this mountain of circumstantial evidence and they were basically saying or their like narrative, their timeline was that Melanie had shot Bill three times on either the 28th of April or the 29th of April in 2004 in their apartment in Woodbridge. One thing that I personally found really suspicious is that Melanie actually stayed in a local hotel from the 29th of April to the 1st of May, which is like, why would she do that, right? The prosecution reckon it's because Bill's body was being kept at the apartment. So she wanted to get out of the apartment, but she still wanted to be close for disposal purposes. And I mean, it makes a lot of sense too, because for what reason would she go and stay at a hotel the day after her husband allegedly walked out on her? If she was feeling lonely, of some sort she didn't want to be in the apartment that they shared together wouldn't she just go to her parents house or something like the prosecution alleged that in the days following her husband's murder on the 28th of the 29th that she went and dismembered his body with a saw and a knife and then stuffed the different body parts into different suitcases and it's likely she was doing this while she was staying at the hotel so she's close by to the house so that she could you know take a little trip while the kids are at daycare to go and dismember his body a little bit and then she can come back home to this hotel where she doesn't have the smell of a dead body and her children don't have to see their father's dead body being dismembered in their apartment. So after this, the prosecution alleged that she then drove her own car and also Bill's car to Atlantic City. And we know that she went to Atlantic City on the 29th because she told Dr. Miller that she did. But I don't think there's any like toll correlation to prove that she went there on the 29th. It's just they only have the correlation where she told Dr. Miller that she was going. And I also don't believe there's any records of Bill's car traveling to Atlantic City at any point, but they do have the toll records that show she went on those two later trips on the 1st of May, coming back on the 2nd of May, and then her going to Atlantic City again on the 18th of May. The state was alleging that the first trip she took, she took with her stepfather, Michael Caparero, in an attempt to make it look like Bill was still alive. Melanie tried on multiple occasions to have these toll records removed after she was questioned about it. There was also an unidentified man who tried to remove these toll records, which people believe was her stepfather, Michael, trying to do this. And then there was also 
the trip to Delaware on the 3rd of May and the prosecution alleged that she drove through Delaware on her way to Virginia where she dumped Bill's body in the suitcases into the Chesapeake Bay. And this also works with the timeline that Bill's body was found in Chesapeake Bay on the 5th of May and the police alleged that the body was still fresh and that's why it didn't smell and the men who discovered it didn't know it was a body until they saw the human remains in the suitcase. Forensic analysis of the bullet wounds in Bill's head and torso also showed that the bullets could have come from the gun that Melanie had purchased two days before Bill went missing and this would later become a contentious topic which we will talk about later we'll touch more on later but they also got a ballistic expert in who said that he agreed that the bullets could have come from the gun that Melanie purchased. It is hard though because the gun was never recovered. They've never found it. The only thing they have to go off is the receipt of purchase. So the receipt from her purchase at this gun store in Pennsylvania shows obviously that she bought the gun and then also shows a second unnamed item for $9.95. And the owner of the shop that she bought it from was questioned and he said there's only two items in his entire store that match that price and one of them was wad cutter bullets. And according to the state forensic experts, the bullets recovered from Bill were wad cutter bullets. In addition to this, forensic experts were also able to pick up these green fibers of polyester fill, which is like a common material that's used in furniture. And Bill's sister, Cindy Lagosh, actually testified that the Maguires had these green throw pillows. So the prosecution was basically alleging that Melanie had used these or one of these green throw pillows as a silencer when she shot Bill. One thing that I mentioned earlier that I didn't really elaborate on is the fact that they found Bill's head and torso wrapped in a hospital blanket. And as it turns out, this hospital blanket is the same kind of blanket they used at the fertility clinic that Melanie worked at. And during the trial, the prosecution actually got someone who worked at like the manufacturing place that manufactured these hospital blankets. And they came in and they testified that, yeah, we supply these blankets to the clinic that Melanie works at. And this wasn't like a major part of the trial, but it's just another piece of circumstantial evidence that's adding on to all the other pieces of circumstantial evidence. And I think this one made her look really suspicious. Another thing that came out during the trial is that when they were searching Bill's car and they did their forensic examination of Bill's car, they actually found a bottle of chloral hydrate and two syringes. And for anyone that doesn't know, chloral hydrate is a sedative. So if you inject someone with it, you're gonna knock them out. The prosecution actually used chemist records and they were able to determine that this bottle of chloral hydrate was picked up the morning Bill disappeared and it was picked up from a chemist that's in a close proximity to the Maguire's children's daycare. The prescription for this chloral hydrate also came from Dr. Miller's prescription pad. So they obviously questioned Dr. Miller about why he's writing out prescriptions for chloral hydrate and he's like, that's not my signature. And in fact, it looks like Melanie McGuire's handwriting. So what the prosecution is alleging happened is that Melanie forged this prescription, went and got this chloral hydrate. She then used it to sedate Bill by pouring it into his drink. And then when he was unconscious, she shot him and she used one of their green throw pillows as a silencer when she did shoot him. And then this all happened in their apartment in Woodbridge. Then after murdering her husband, they alleged that Melanie took Bill's Blackberry and sent an email to two of his supervisors that said, I will be out sick today. And Bill's phone was actually recovered. It was found in the back, in the trunk of his car when they found his car. And they found that one of these emails actually never sent because they got the, whoever sent it got the email wrong. And Bill obviously knows the correct email of his supervisors. So this is just another thing that they used against Melanie, another piece of circumstantial evidence. According to the prosecution, Melanie also made a one minute phone call to a friend of Bill's on the 30th of April to make it look like he was still alive. This friend testified that he never received a call from Bill on the 30th of April and that Bill would also always leave a message, but no message was left. Another crucial bit of information that came out during the trial is the forensic analysis of the Maguire's family computer. They found searches on it that were things like undetectable poisons, how to purchase a gun illegally, how to commit murder. And Melanie's defense to this was, I'm a nurse. Like, 
I know how to do these things. And if I didn't, I would look on my work database. Like she always played up this, oh, I'm so intelligent. I'm way too intelligent to have left any evidence behind or anything. I would never be so stupid to leave these searches behind. I would never be so stupid to use our own suitcases. The prosecutor even said either Melanie McGuire is guilty or she is the most unlucky woman in the world, which is so true because like how could all of this circumstantial evidence against her be explained reasonably? It can't. Like maybe individually it could, but as a whole, like this mountain of circumstantial evidence, how could you reasonably explain that? I mean, in relation to the search history, it was a family computer, so they couldn't actually determine if it was Bill or Melanie. So it wasn't like that much of a gotcha, but why would Bill be searching these things? It's just too much of a coincidence that these things were searched right before he disappeared. Now, the real gotcha came from something else. It came from another forensic analysis of Bill's car, where they found all of these really really small pieces of human flesh, which they referred to as human sawdust. And this is something you saw in pretty much every newspaper headline, every news headline at the time of the trial, human sawdust. And DNA tests confirm that this human flesh belonged to Bill McGuire. Obviously he wasn't dismembered in his car or anything. So the prosecution's thought process was that whoever murdered him brought this like human sawdust with them on their shoes unwittingly. and. If you remember, they have placed Melanie in Bill's car at around the time of the murder. Like I said earlier, the defense was really trying to push this narrative that Bill was like this crazy gambler, that maybe he owed some money to some sketchy people and he didn't pay some of them back and one of those people murdered him, which look, it could be a good theory, but I don't think it's good enough to forget all of the circumstantial evidence against Melanie because there is no circumstantial evidence to indicate somebody he owed money killed him. Like there's no evidence to suggest that at all. So really what the prosecution has to do now is they have to prove Melanie's motive. In testimony from Brad Miller, he went into great detail about the extent of the affair between himself and Melanie and he denied any involvement in Bill's murder. He denied having any knowledge of Melanie buying a gun and he also denied knowing about the CCTV footage showing Melanie moving the car in Atlantic City. The prosecution has always said that they believe Melanie had an accomplice because there's just no way she could have driven both her and Bill's car up to Atlantic City at the same time. Somebody would have had to driven either her car or Bill's car while she drove the other car. Like two people had to bring those two cars up to Atlantic City. But at this point, you know, police had pretty much cleared Dr. Miller. They didn't think that he was involved. He was very cooperative during the investigation, during the trial. He even let the them record his phone conversations with Melanie. I mean, personally, it's still a little suspicious because they have such an intimate affair. They started talking so much more after Bill disappeared and they're obviously both very intelligent people. So it's hard to believe that he had no idea anything suspicious was going on. Some of the phone calls with Dr. Miller and also her family members were used in the trial to not only show her motive with the affair and all of that sort of thing, but also just to show a little bit of her character. You know, the way that she was speaking in these phone calls, I will play some excerpts of these phone calls, but just the way that she was speaking about Bill's murder and Bill's death was just not the way a grieving wife would act. And I know that he was allegedly abusive and honestly, like if he was abusive, I can definitely see her feeling relieved, but the way that she was talking, it just didn't, it didn't seem like that. Every time you get your head back above water. Yep. And that hand reaches out from beyond the grave. As I mentioned earlier, the prosecution also looked at Melanie's stepfather, Michael, as a potential accomplice. They believe that he may have been the one who drove out to Atlantic City with her on one occasion, although there was no evidence to back this up. The phone call I played for you earlier, I also think that suggests that he wasn't entirely open with the police and he was either trying to protect himself or protect his stepdaughter in some way. And when I say that he wasn't open with the police, like he was cooperative with them, but he held his cards very close to his chest. He never gave them information unless they specifically asked. He wasn't just, you know, forthright and just giving them everything he knew. Personally, I also think if Melanie was innocent, it would look a lot less suspicious if she was just forthright with them about purchasing the gun, about moving Bill's car, but instead she really tried to hide it. Like when they first questioned her, she was like, no, Bill left 
and I didn't hear from him and I didn't try to contact him and I wanted nothing to do with him. I wiped my hands of him that day. Oh, and you should also go and see if his car's in Atlantic City because that's where I reckon he went. So she pointed them to the car because she knew it was there, even though at first she tried to say, oh, I reckon it's there because I reckon that's where he went instead of being like, I know it's there because I went and moved it to mess with him. It's just little inconsistencies like that that make her look guilty. So anyway, after 23 days of testimony from over 80 different witnesses, it was time for the jury to deliberate. They took three days and then on the 23rd of April in 2007, they found Melanie McGuire guilty of first degree murder. And then on the 19th of July of that same year, she was sentenced to life in prison. She was then taken to the Edna Mahan Correctional Facility for women in Clinton, New Jersey, and she will not be eligible for parole until she's 100 years old. She was also convicted on lesser charges of possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose, the desecration of human remains and perjury. And then there were also some other charges she was acquitted of, including two counts of hindering apprehension, tampering with evidence and possession of Xanax without a prescription. Something about this case that has garnered a lot of attention is just the sheer amount of reasonable doubt that can be applied in this case. I don't really know where I stand on how fair her sentencing is, but there have been numerous appeal attempts and a lot of, you know, media publications trying to clear her name. Melanie herself has even appeared on a podcast called Direct Appeal, which the entire purpose of this podcast is to try and exonerate her. One major talking point on the podcast is about the murder weapon and the fact that the gun Melanie purchased was probably not the murder weapon that was used. And the reason they believe this is because guns make these like specific impressions on bullets when they leave the barrel, when they're fired. So these markings are known as lands and grooves and they are specific to the gun and they should be able to be used to match a bullet to a specific type of gun. It's alleged that the lands and grooves on the bullets that were used to kill Bill were not consistent with the gun that Melanie purchased. The lead prosecutor at the time of the trial in a later interview said that these inconsistencies stem from incorrect data being listed on the manufacturer of the gun's website. During the trial, ballistic experts also testified that these bullets could have come from the gun that Melanie purchased. So, you know, obviously take all of this as you will because the murder weapon, the gun has never been recovered. So I guess we'll never truly know. Another talking point on the podcast was about the garbage bags that Bill's body were found inside of and how the same type of garbage bags were actually found at the Maguire's apartment. And then they also had a forensic expert testify at Melanie's trial that there was specific markings on these garbage bags that showed they were made in the same facility at roughly the same time. But in the podcast, they allege there could have been more testing done on these garbage bags. Personally, I don't think that this was like a major part of the jury's decision anyway, considering all of the other circumstantial evidence. But something on the podcast that I thought had a little bit more merit was a conversation they had about the forensic evidence inside the suitcase and the garbage bags. It wasn't really dwelled on a lot in the trial because it wasn't deemed necessary. But basically, there was animal hair found in the suitcases and the garbage bags and, you know, on the remains. So this is something that could suggest that Bill wasn't murdered at the Maguire's apartment and he was actually murdered somewhere where there was like an animal presence because Melanie doesn't really have any connection to animals at all. Like, she doesn't have any pets. She doesn't go and visit anyone's pets. She doesn't go and visit, like, animals, really. There's no connection of that. And so they didn't really talk about it at the trial because they didn't think it was necessary because she doesn't have any connection to like any animals really. So it does beg the question like where did this animal hair come from? And also just you know that's almost everything I have but just before we wrap up this video I do want to mention something else I found a little bit suspicious is first of all Melanie had Bill's body cremated so quick and his funeral apparently only lasted like 10-15 minutes. Despite Melanie's efforts and the efforts of others, it has never been enough to get a successful appeal and Melanie still remains in the same prison serving her sentence. And that's it. That's everything from me today, guys. I would love to hear your thoughts on this case because it's a crazy one. First of all, there's no physical evidence tying Melanie to the crime whatsoever, but there is a mountain of circumstantial evidence against her and no circumstantial evidence to implicate anybody else. There's no circumstantial evidence to implicate the fact that this may have been somebody killing him over like a gambling debt or something, nothing. 
all of the circumstantial evidence points to Melanie. So I'm inclined to believe she's guilty. If he was abusive, then I don't believe she deserves to be serving a sentence until she's 100 years old. But my real question here is, did she have an accomplice? How did she get to Atlantic City, both her car and Bill's car, to Atlantic City by herself? Did she catch a taxi? I mean, it would have been an awfully expensive taxi ride and there's no records of it. I mean, she could have paid the taxi in cash, so that would leave no records of her driving there. And it would be really hard to track down a specific trip so far after the fact. I'm inclined to believe she did have an accomplice, but it's just like, who would she have spoken to that about? Like, who would she feel comfortable enough to be like, hey, I murdered my husband, can you help me? I'm inclined to believe that Brad Miller was not involved, but you know, maybe her stepfather. It could explain why they were talking super weirdly on the phone and kind of like they were talking in code or something. He's really the only person that there is any sort of indication that he may have been involved, in my personal opinion. Like, nobody else has really been implicated the only reason Dr. Miller was implicated is because he was having the affair, but there's nothing else to suggest that he was an accomplice or involved at all, even on their phone calls. The only person that could possibly be implicated, in my opinion, is the stepfather, if she did have an accomplice. But yeah, I would love to know what you guys think. So let's chat in the comments down below because this is an absolute doozy of a case. I would love to hear your thoughts. I would love to hear any other case suggestions you have down below. And that's it from me for now, guys, for the rest of the year. I hope you guys have a wonderful holiday season. I hope you have a wonderful new year and I will see you guys in 2023. Bye guys.